Our gospel lesson comes again from Mark's gospel. We're at the very beginning of Mark's gospel at this point. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was over a year ago when a young friend of mine who is, was at the time employed by the Archdiocese of Baltimore and working in a Catholic congregation and had been raised Catholic and practiced the Catholic faith his entire life. But he and his wife had become discouraged and they started out to look for another congregation. The first church they visit happened to be United Methodist because he knew me. And he contacted me after his visit and he said to me, can you explain something to me about the United Methodist Church? That just always scares you when you hear that because you don't know what's coming next. And what came next shocked me, to be honest. He said, can you explain to me why United Methodist Churches don't read scripture during worship? And I replied, huh? He said, and why they don't use the Lord's Prayer? And I went, what? And I was amazed at that, and I said, what church did you attend? And he told me, and it's one of the largest churches in the annual conference. And I asked some of my colleagues, why in the world is scripture not read in a church, especially a church with so many people? What are they going for? And they said, oh, Terry, you are so old school, aren't you? I'm thinking, yeah, you know, we've already established this is not my real hair color. But I went to seminary 35 years ago. I studied with people who studied with Karl Barth, if you know the man who wrote Church Dogmatics. And I was told that people don't want to hear scripture in church because they don't understand it. They understand the way Jesus taught, which is to use parables to compare the word of God with what they could understand. I get that. That's why everybody likes the stories and the jokes and the little illustrations you use during sermons more than they like the other material. That's why people, let me be honest with you, that's why they like the children's sermon more than the adult sermon. Because somebody told me once, if I get that one, I feel like I've done something good that day. And when I looked at the passages we read this morning, I sort of thought, oh, I see why people don't want to read scripture in the service, because they're weird sometimes, aren't they? Smoke and blood and things dissolving and burning up. That's what we got from Peter's epistle, one of the newest writings in the Old Testament, meaning one of the last ones written that formed the canon of Scripture. And even Isaiah with strange images that don't make sense to us. And even the story of Jesus, which is better than the one we read last week, because at least this one has characters. John the Baptist is out there yelling in the wilderness. But what in the world does a guy wearing camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, standing in the water screaming, repent and be baptized, eating bugs. I don't care how good the honey is. If you dip a bug in honey, it's still a bug. What does that have to do with us? But you know, I don't think there are any passages I have read in this past year since this stinking pandemic began that speak more to where we are than these passages this morning for the second Sunday of Advent the Sunday of Advent that we talk about is the Sunday of peace. How many of you feel very peaceful these days? I sure as heck do not. But they all have something in common. It's about people waiting and wandering in the wilderness. If we are not waiting and wandering in the wilderness, I don't know where we are right now. Isaiah's passage, the 40th chapter of Isaiah, written at a very different time than the 39th chapter of Isaiah. 39th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah has been saying to the people all along, God is going to let you suffer the consequences of your own behavior if you're not careful. And certainly that is what happened because between 39 and 40, they have been carried off into exile into Babylon. I am so glad that God called me to be a pastor most days 
I'm awfully glad God never called me to be a prophet. Nobody ever wanted to see a prophet coming because what did they talk about? Gloom and doom. You're going to get it. God's watching you people. You better watch out. You better not pout. That's a different story, isn't it? But they talked gloom and doom and the people didn't want to see them coming. Although sometimes the kings, even the corrupt kings of Israel, took seriously the claims of a prophet who was speaking for God. And he had preached that destruction would come upon the people, and certainly it had. But then immediately, it's as if the prophet is saying in that intervening chapter that we don't have, that time of exile, now that I have your attention, let me tell you what God is going to do. God is going to comfort you. God is going to come to you. God is going to be there with you. A voice is going to cry out in the wilderness. Ah, ha, ha, ha. We just read about that in the gospel, didn't we? Prepare the way of the Lord. Cry out. Go up to a mountain and cry out. But the people answer sort of collectively, what shall I cry? We're like grass. We're dying here. What shall I cry? But then the word comes. Say to the world, here is your God. Because even in exile, what does he refer to them as? But Zion, the city, the holy city of God. Jerusalem, the city that they had been forced to leave behind with the temple. Their faith, their everyday lives, the promised land. They are still that people, even in exile, even in the wilderness. They are God's people and God will bring them home as a shepherd tenderly carries the sheep. That is who God is and that's what we're supposed to proclaim. Well, when you hear the story of John the Baptist, you're so used to hearing that story, you probably don't read it like a Jew of the time who would have said, aha, maybe this is Elijah coming back to us because that's who they were waiting for. Maybe this is one of the prophets of old. Maybe this is the Messiah. And John is very careful, to not John the Baptist is very careful to say, the one who is coming after me is greater than I am. I baptize you with water water like a bath that's exactly what he was doing he was calling the people to repentance and they were getting in the water and internally they were being cleansed of their sins different than the baptism that we participate in today but it has its roots in that cleansing of sin and john the cousin of our lord jesus christ out there preparing the way for the one who is to come after him now, if you think, I'm glad I'm not a prophet, you probably are glad that you're not people of faith living in the time that these passages were written, both the Isaiah and the Mark passage. Because when the people were out of their land in exile, or when they were invaded by the Roman Empire, the Romans occupying the land at the time of Jesus' birth, the time that John is proclaiming, the time of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, all under Roman occupation and rule. If you were minding your own business, doing your own job, and there was a road to be paved because someone important was coming down the road, you were pulled out of your life and you were put on the road crew. Anyone here ever worked on a road crew? I haven't. Jim, you have hard work, I'm guessing, very hard work, because you have to make the road level for the king or whoever the dignitary du jour is who's riding along. You have to make the path straight, which means that if there's a hill, you have to knock it down. If there's a pothole, you have to fill it in. But look at what Isaiah says. When God comes, it's not just the potholes and the ruts. The mountains themselves will be leveled and the valleys will be raised up. The rough places will be made a plain and God is going to come and everyone's going to recognize the glory of our God who then is going to come to us and carry us like a lamb home with the shepherd. That's a promise. I hope just a little bit of biblical exegesis, which is what you call looking at what the passage meant in its context and trying to put it into ours, will show you how much we're talking about what's going on today. And even the passage that we read from Peter, the people had lost hope that Christ was ever coming back. It had been decades. And they thought he was going to come back at any moment that this generation would not pass away until these things had happened. And they're saying, where is he? Why should we bother to continue to worship this absentee God? Why should we continue to proclaim Jesus Christ in the midst of the horror in which we're living? Because they were living at a time of persecution by the same Roman Empire. 
And then we hear the words that we sing in that great song, O God, our help in ages past. A thousand ages in God's sight are like an evening gone. Time doesn't matter to God. Time has a different meaning in the world that is to come. I've told you before, I think when people die here, I don't know if they rest in their graves until Christ returns or not, but I know it's just like being put under anesthesia. You close your eyes and you wake up and there's Jesus Christ. Like no time has passed whatsoever. We're in the fullness of his kingdom where we will live forever. But until that day, we are called to make peace in his name. We're called to understand that if he's delayed in coming back, what Peter's explanation is, do you remember? He's given us all a chance to repent, just as John called us to repentance. Not so that we can save ourselves. It's not about that. But Advent, this time of waiting, is a good time to look into your own heart. I look into my own heart and see what is there that needs to change, what needs to be turned back to God so that I can go to God in the fullness of time when my time comes so that God can carry me home as a lamb. But until that time, we're called to proclaim, to get up on the mountain and prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe you're not going to be on the road crew, but don't we have an expression in today's world, paving the way? Have you ever paved the way for someone else? Perhaps someone in your office, if you had an office job. Perhaps someone, if you were a teacher, you paved the way for them to get a scholarship or to learn. Perhaps if you're a musician and you've taught someone, you've paved the way for them into a different career or into a different way of doing things. We are called to prepare the way for others, to pave the way for them to God in Jesus Christ. We do that by our proclamation of who God is, to say to the world, at this time when God seems so far away, God is closer to us than our next heartbeat and our own breath, that God is with us, God will get us through. Doesn't mean, however, that things are gonna be easy. I told you during the announcements that I personally know five people who have died of COVID-19 in the last week. Beyond that, on Facebook, I saw a friend of mine, Sonia, I haven't seen her in years, but her brother, who drives an ambulance, died this week, very young man. Bruce Birch, who was the dean of Wesley Theological Seminary, when I was there, he was a professor of Old Testament. His brother, Morris, died this week of COVID-19. And even our beloved Mary Palmer, who died this week, did not die of COVID, but had COVID at the time of her death, and that kept her in isolation without contact with her family. We really do feel like we're in the wilderness, don't we? I shared with you before that my mother said to me once when she was going through her treatment for breast cancer, said to me, the one lesson that cancer gives you, the one gift it gives you, is it teaches you never to take a moment of your life for granted. That's what we're called to do now, to proclaim who God is in our midst, to proclaim shalom, peace. Peace is not just the absence of warfare. Peace is people having what they need. Peace is people having enough to eat. And over 200 million Americans right now, no, I'm over 20 million Americans, sorry. Got the number wrong. Over 20 million Americans this week reported not having enough food for their families. What should I cry out? I understand that voice of despair because people around us are losing a fight that we seem incapable of fighting anymore. But that is when we have to proclaim Christ for each other. We have to pave the way for others to faith in our God. I'm thinking this morning, not just about Santa Claus, I'm thinking about another great hero of mine, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. I was just too old for Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I was cool. I was 11 years old when his show came on the air. I would not be watching that children's show, but I have watched him so often as an adult. You know, he, like me and Santa, the three of us, we were, we were together in a lot of ways. He was a pastor, an ordained Presbyterian pastor who was ordained to be a televangelist. That was his church, his PBS show out of Pittsburgh. And one of the wisest things he ever said was, his mother taught him a great lesson in life, that whenever there's trouble and you don't know where to look, look for the people who are helping. Look for the people who are helping. Look for the Santas. 
look for the disciples of Jesus Christ. That's who we're called to be for each other. Not to forget when we come to church, even if we have to come to church during the week because we're not worshiping together on weekends anymore. Not to forget the Cockeysville Food Pantry. Not to forget giving to you can. Not to forget helping others in the name of Jesus Christ because that's what leads them down that road to him. So many times people have said to me, I don't know what it is that you're doing or why you're doing it, and that's an opportunity for me to say, I'm not doing anything for you because I'm a good person. I'm not doing anything for you other than what my Savior in Jesus Christ has taught me to do. I always think of Elizabeth Lamaster, who is now Pastor Lamaster, who is now the Reverend Dr. Lamaster. She sort of just cruised right on by me. I was her pastor years ago, and now she's a pastor herself. She's going to do our audit for us, and she's even going to come in and be recorded playing the harpsichord for us for one of our services because she's a musician and used to be a forensic accountant and a paralegal before entering the ministry. She entered the ministry after going on a mission trip to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Their translators there were teenage girls, all Muslim, not necessarily by faith but by culture. Not necessarily by choice, but because that area of the Balkans was taken over by Muslim forces centuries before. Now, there were some older women on the trip with Elizabeth who told them all they needed to get Jesus in their hearts or burn in hell. They didn't want to hang out with those ladies. But Elizabeth said they came to her and said, why are you doing this? They said, we hear everyone in America is rich. You all have 58 pairs of shoes, and Elizabeth does, but that's a different story. But they said, you have cars and homes and jewels and things. And Elizabeth said, I don't have all those things. I'm getting ready to go to school, and I don't have that much really now. And she said, then why are you here helping us? And Elizabeth said, because that's what Jesus has asked me to do with my life. And when she got back to the United States... Four Muslim teenage girls wrote to her and said, could you find us a Bible in Serbo-Croatian that we could read? Pave the way. John made the world ready for Christ. If you were as old as me or older, you remember learning in elementary school that the robin is the harbinger of spring, right? Do you all know what a harbinger is? It's the one who comes before to announce the way. John the Baptist was the harbinger of Jesus Christ coming into the world. Be someone's harbinger, be someone's Santa Claus, be someone's Mr. Rogers, be someone's Jesus incarnate in you and your actions and the love you have for each other. We all have things we need to repent of, things we need to turn from so that we can turn fully to God. Use this holy season as an opportunity for that. And it's the last time we gather together for communion, and if you're gathering with communion at home, this morning, God bless you. That's okay. But when we confess our sins and we leave some time for everyone to confess in silence, give to God the stuff you need to get rid of and let God take it once and for all. You can do that. You can get rid of bigotry and prejudice. You can get rid of anger. You can get rid of all kinds of things that keep you bound because God in Jesus Christ has paved the way for you. So recognize that God is in our midst. Proclaim that God is in our midst, in communion, in the ministries of this church, in each other, and in yourself. And then be ready to announce the great, glorious good news of the one who is to come. Amen. <laughs>